Welcome everyone to the very first webinar of the Harvard Extension School Psychology Student Society. We are thrilled to bring you this event, which has been one of the most requested by our members. We understand that it has the potential to have a tremendous impact on our students' academic and professional success, and we want to do everything in our power to help them. That's why we've made it a top priority to offer this webinar, and we hope that you find it informative and beneficial. And thank you for joining us today. But before we begin, I want to emphasize that the information shared in this session is meant to enhance your knowledge and understanding, and it should not be seen as a replacement for consulting your academic advisor. While we strive to provide accurate and reliable information, it's important to discuss your academic plans and decisions with your advisor to make sure they align with your academic goals and requirements. My name is Kimia Grigoriev, and I'm the founder and president of HES PSS. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to express my gratitude for our amazing team who has worked tirelessly to bring this event to life, as well as the many more that we have in store for you. At the end of this session, we will be sharing some of the exciting events that we have coming up, so please stay tuned. If you're not already a member, please make sure to join us. You can scan the QR code on this page to be directed to the registration form, or you can visit hesps.org, and our form is at the bottom of the homepage. Also, please feel welcome to join any of our social media sites that are listed. We have a Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn page, LinkedIn group, a YouTube channel, and also a WhatsApp, which is open to Harvard students. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Max Krasnow. He is a highly respected and esteemed professor, speaker, researcher, and we're fortunate enough to call him our wonderful faculty advisor for the Harvard Extension School Psychology Student Society. We are truly honored to have his invaluable guidance, support, and advice. With a decade of teaching experience at Harvard in the college, Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and in the Extension School, his expertise is vast and invaluable. Prior to joining Harvard, Dr. Krasnow earned his PhD in psychology from UC Santa Barbara with a focus on developmental and evolutionary psychology. His background and expertise make his insights incredibly valuable to our society and its members. Additionally, Dr. Krasnow is known for consistently going above and beyond for his students to ensure their academic and professional success. We are incredibly grateful to have him as our society's advisor and as one of our speakers today. Please help me welcome Dr. Max Krasnow. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming and thank you for that great introduction, Kimia. So today we're going to be sharing some of the things that um, you can look forward to if uh, you choose an ALM in psychology path or as you finish your ALM in psychology. Um, we're gonna be focusing on those ending components, the thesis track and the capstone track, letting you know um, what those things entail, why you might choose one or the other and what kind of future opportunities in your life one or the other might be more appropriate for. Um, I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, Dr. Adrian Tierney um, and a very large panel of um, uh, experts in uh, one area of this or the other that I'll be introducing later. Um, you'll have the chance to ask us questions and as a panel, I'm sure someone on the panel will be have the expertise to answer you. So um, my task right now is to talk about um, a kind of first pass at what differentiates a thesis from a capstone and why you might choose one or the other. And then I'm going to give you some more information about what goes into pursuing a capstone. And then I'll hand things over to Dr. Tierney, and she will describe the same thing for a thesis. So. The analogy that I like to use is the difference between particle physics and engineering. So if you, you know, follow any of the news that comes out of particle physics, you know that there's um, 
models and experiments that are finding new particles and bosons and this and that and the other, right? Um, discovering new things about the world, that kind of basic science, that's a thesis. In a thesis, what you would be doing is designing an experiment, conducting that experiment to contribute knowledge. A capstone, on the other hand, is taking knowledge that already exists to help solve an identified problem, much the same way that an engineer, when confronted with a problem in the world or one that they're presented to by their presented by their boss, um, they use what's known about materials and elect, uh, elect, uh, electrodynamics, et cetera, uh, to solve that problem. Here in the ALM program, we have four capstone tracks. And what's involved in a capstone track is taking what is organized into two courses. There's a pre-capstone and a capstone. And you take those in your spring, in your fall and spring terms of your ultimate year in the program. The four capstone tracks that we have currently are human development, identity, psychometrics, and applied educational psychology. And I can uh, say a few words about what each of those topics entails. Across those four tracks, the pre-capstone serves as the design phase. In those classes, students are led deeply into those topics where they learn um, some of the foundational material in those areas. Of course, students also are coming in with expertise that they have from their own lives and also from the courses they've taken throughout their degree. And they're guided, students are guided in that pre-capstone um, through a series of assignments that helps culminate with a capstone proposal. That capstone proposal is essentially the same thing that you might do in a thesis process or a same thing that I did in my dissertation. Um, we called it a prospectus. It's essentially um, motivating and proving to an evaluator that you know what you're doing and that you have a plan for success. So in a successful proposal, you would be walking through the background of the problem in the world that you're trying to solve. You would be going into some of the established science that'll help you solve it. And you're pitching a prototype design. A prototype is one of the deliverables that you're going to end up producing in the capstone term. Um, and so those deliverables are essentially what you are proposing in that proposal. Those two deliverables in the capstone term are terms the report and the prototype. The report is an academic paper, and it's probably the thing that is the closest to what you would have been producing on the thesis track. The prototype is hard to describe in a few words because it really can take a lot of forms. The prototype is your substantive bite out of the problem that you were designing a solution for. And that substantive bite can range from something relatively abstract to almost or entirely that concrete completed solution. So let me give you an example. Um, say you were designing a curriculum to reach a particular population of students who is at need of a particular kind of material. And the um, way they need to be taught has unique challenges. And so um, this particular population of students hasn't had this need met for multiple reasons. Now, that curriculum may be within your power to develop over the course of the capstone term. If so, amazing. You're in, you ended up on this side of the spectrum of being able to have a relatively completed thing. 
On the other hand, that thing that you pitched as the solution may be very large, very ambitious, not something that can be accomplished in a four-month term. In that case, what you would be shooting for is something on the more abstract end of the spectrum of what a prototype can be. And the examples that I like to give students are like um, a white paper. So if this is something you would have ever encountered, it's essentially like a document where you're laying out the right way to solve a problem and proposing essentially the solution that it would be. And in this case, that prototype and report would actually end up fairly similar, but what would differentiate them is they're for different audiences. The report would be speaking to an academic audience that was interested in your project. The white paper would be directed at potential adopters, someone who could potentially be putting your plan into action or who might, you know, hire you to do that. <laughs> Things that are kind of in that intermediate space get closer to that final form, and they often take the form of pieces that could be used to move the project along towards real-world application. So, for example, if what you were doing was proposing an app that could be used to, again, solve this problem that you're interested in solving, but you're not an app developer. And in reality, if you were going to go forward with this project, you wouldn't teach yourself how to code in order to do this yourself. You would potentially be hiring on a team or using a company services or getting a startup and, and bringing on like a, a technical uh, uh, officer. And so the question of what you could do within your pro within your capstone term to make a prototype that successfully moves that project along so that it has a, a better chance of success in the real world, it's designed for a particular stakeholder of your project. And so it takes the form that is appropriate for that stakeholder. So in this example of a um, app to be developed, well, what would a developer need if it's not their idea and they don't know what you want? Well, what you could give them is like a wireframe. You could put together essentially what is everything that's supposed to happen in your app? How is the layout? How is the workflow through the different screens and functions? That's something that can express the entire design of your solution without actually needing you to go through all of the process of actually creating that application. And there's actually some pretty cool software platforms that make some pretty fancy uh, wireframes. Um, but that wireframe is then something that you could take to a developer to facilitate the actual development of that project. And so... If you think about prototypes kind of on this spectrum, there's really lots of opportunities to have single prototype pieces or a collection of lots of prototype pieces that together represent a substantive bite out of the problem that moves that solution towards reality. And that's that's really like in in my sense, the goal of that capstone prototype. Okay, so you have the pre-capstone term. That pre-capstone term, you're doing reading, you're doing discussion, you're in the content area, and you're working on developing your idea. You turn in your proposal over break or ending that term. Um, your faculty will be evaluating that proposal. And if it meets bar. If it is a project that looks like you know what you're doing, you have a plan that looks like you can succeed, those are going to be some of the criteria that's going to advance you into the capstone term. Part of my decision making in my capstones is I don't want to advance students into the capstone term if I'm not confident that they can succeed. It's not a good use of their time or my time, right? Um, and so working with students to set them up into a position 
where they can actually get to those successful proposals so that they're in a position to have a successful capstone term, that's a big part of the agenda of the pre-capstone term. Then in the capstone term, the agenda is really action. You have that approved proposal, and your job is to make it so, right? Now, students are often worried that at that proposal stage, they might not know what they can achieve or what the exact right way everything will turn out. I like to use the phrasing of, you know, unknown unknowns in this case. It's hard to anticipate all of the problems you might have or all of the opportunities you have when you don't know what you're going to do next because you haven't actually lived those experiences. And so students um, are often have that concern that they're locked into what's in their proposal. And at least uh, for my capstones, the answer is um, the big picture is relatively locked, but the smaller details are a lot more flexible. And in consultation with me, there's lots of revision possible, right? As you discover that, oh, that's going to take a lot longer than I thought, but I can do this other thing instead, which actually is an even better idea. Awesome. We're going to make that shift. And so throughout the capstone term, there's, again, scaffolding assignments to help develop the project in its ideation, to help develop those final deliverables, the prototype and the report, and to help students end up at that completed stage where they've done that thing. They've submitted that capstone prototype representing that substantive bite out of the problem. And they have that report, which now I can give you a little bit more feed, uh, context on. That report is the academic paper that justifies, motivates, and describes the prototype. Writing the report, you're assuming that someone has access to the prototype. And so you don't need to completely contain within the report the prototype. And submitting the prototype, you can assume that people, if needed, have the report. And so you don't need to recapitulate all the justification within the prototype. But thinking of these two things somewhat side by side, what the report is doing and what, what you're doing in the report is going through all of that background information to help a reader understand what is the problem? Um, why is this a problem? Why hasn't it been solved yet? And why is it worthy of your energy right now? Why is it an important problem? Then what's your solution? What is this thing that you've made, this prototype? Or what is this prototype on the way towards? Why does it have that design? This is where you leverage the learning that you've had and your prior expertise, outside expertise, research that you've done into the literature to motivate the design of the specific elements of your prototype. Why does it have this structure? Why are you using this kind of teaching pedagogy? Why are you using this kind of assignment? That kind of thing. And then the last piece of the report, the way that I, I encourage my students to organize it, is a discussion that takes the question, um, okay, now that we have this prototype, what's next, right? What are the things that need to happen to take this thing that is somewhat meta and actually have it have its effect in the real world? What are those next necessary steps to make it a thing? And then retrospective, taking a broader view when you've dived in to focus in on the particular solvable thing that you can achieve in a capstone term, you've probably narrowed in on a subset of the problem that you were interested in in the first place. And so that's a place where you step back and say, okay, this has solved this piece of the problem, but acknowledging that there's other parts of the problem that haven't been addressed by this prototype. And that opens up those next opportunities because those are not necessarily 
just negative limitations, right? Just because you haven't solved it yet doesn't mean that it's not solvable. And so that's a place where you can use that creativity and all of that experience you have in developing that project over that year to start to think about what those next steps of the project could be to help it have a better impact. And so that essentially is what the capstone is. I've given you the description that um, is closest to the way that it works in my two capstone sequences. Again, I teach um, psychometrics, which um, if you don't know what that you know big fancy word means, psychometrics is just the collection of tools and kind of the way of thinking about how we measure the mind. And so a lot of what goes into a psychometrics capstone is um, thinking about a test that exists already. How do you make it better? Is it um, in need of revision? Is it potentially useful for a different population? Is um, performance on it? Is um, the results of someone taking that test something that would be useful for lots of people to know about themselves? And so making it available to them is something that um, would be solving a problem. Um, is there a test that doesn't exist that should? And then would you design one? So psychometrics is about answering those kinds of questions and finding solutions in that space. The applied ed psych capstone sequence is about taking what we've learned, what has is known about how people learn and using that established science to help teach somebody something. And that somebody doesn't have to be, you know, the standard kind of K-12 educational situation that most people think of when they think of educational psychology. Um, but really, there's lots of people who need to learn lots of things, and that is the domain of educational psychology. Um, all right, so that is my piece. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions about the capstone um, process and my capstones in particular once we get to the question and answer period. But at this time, I would like to turn things over to Dr. Adrian Tierney. All right, thank you. Let me just see how I adjust this. Okay, great. All right, thank you, thanks. Okay, so that was an excellent um, overview of the capstone from Dr. Krasno. Um, and as I'm listening to it, I can kind of see the, the analogies and also the differences between the thesis tracks. So I'm gonna try and communicate them to you as clearly as I can. Um, and then later for the question and answer, I used to teach the capstone and human development. So if there are questions that are associated with that, I can also field some of them. Um, but I thought that was a really wonderful overview. Um, so first off, thank you to this group for, for inviting me um, to be here because I just, I think it's really wonderful that you guys are having this event. Um, as Dr. Krasno said in the beginning, we're kind of fast forwarding to the end of your program. And yet I think that successfully navigating your time in the program really would benefit from thinking about that way ahead of time. So I, I really appreciate that you guys are, are having this um, session now. Um, so the way that I'd like to talk about the thesis is in um, focusing a lot on the chronology, on the different steps of it, because one of the biggest differences between the capstone and the thesis is the timeline. Um, it takes a longer timeline, um, and it's a little bit, it has structure, but it's structured in a different way, and then there are periods when it's actually very self-directed, and so for you to have a sense of how things work over time, I think gives you a little bit more control over deciding when you're going to get started, when do you want to um, meet with me or the other researchers research advisor, Dante Spetter. Um, I think if you have a good sense of how it is encapsulated, you can start to make some um, decisions about whether, you know, when in the process do you need to make this decision. Um, if at any point you're having that question of the capstone versus the thesis, please come and see any of us, um, whether it's Dr. Krasno or Chuck Houston, who is here as well, um, me or um, Dante Spetter, the other research advisor, we're more than happy to talk with you about your specific goals and how they fit into the context of these two options. 
So the first part of the thesis process is, as you can imagine, a kind of pre-thesis advising period. And I recommend that you do that early on in the process. You can do that after you've taken a couple of classes, you can do it after, you know, at the very beginning. Um, coming to meet with us early on is a really good thing. In any circumstance, you should be coming to meet with us at least a semester before you want to submit your pre-work. The pre-work step is the first formal step in the thesis process. There are two pre-work deadlines. One is in November, November 1st, um, and the other one is in June, on June 1st. Um, in the, they, they correspond to the different semesters of the Crafting the Thesis Proposal course. So if you are interested in taking the fall Crafting the Thesis Proposal, you have to submit your pre-work that um, by the June prior to that semester, June 1st prior to that semester. If you're interested in taking the spring um, Crafting the Thesis Proposal, you have to have submitted your pre-work by November 1st of that prior semester. So those deadlines are um, in lockstep with the semesters that the Crafting the Thesis Proposal uh, takes place. Um, the the pre-work has a very structured set of guidelines that you need to follow and all of them live on the thesis process website. We're happy to share them with you and also I'm happy to talk them through with you because the way to approach them isn't necessarily the way um, the way that they're written. Um, but I'm happy to get into the details about that either in the question and answer period or with you um, in in um, in particular. So the pre-work, let's say you submit the pre-work for June 1st of this year. Um, that goes to the administrative process. They make sure that you have gone through all of your course requirements. They'll let you know what's coming up next. And then they send your pre-work to me. I look at that pre-work. I read it to evaluate a number of different things about it. Um, and I'll go into those in a few, a few minutes. Um, once I've given I've given the document feedback, I send it to you for revisions. Um, those revisions can be kind of very focused, they can be big in scope, there are lots of different kinds of, of revisions, but um, the, the kind of logistics of it are that you have up to three submissions per pre-work deadline um, to get feedback on, and then at that point we decide, okay, is this pre-work ready for the crafting the thesis proposal, or do you really need a longer timeline to do a number of things? It might be that you need to familiarize yourself with the literature a little bit more. It might mean that there are, are, are kind of other issues about the, the writing that we might need to work on. Um, but for each pre-work deadline, you have three submissions. The first one is when you submit it to thesis underscore pre-work. Um, and then there are opportunities for me to give you feedback um, twice and you submit the um, the pre-work with your revisions two more times. The things that I'm looking for the most in the pre-work are kind of there, they fall into two categories. The first one is, is there a research question that is very clearly motivated by your evaluation of the scholarly literature? Now that doesn't have to be that you are an expert in the field, but you have to be able to tell me how your research question builds on but differs from existing literature in some very specific way. Um, it might not be that you've read everything in the field, but you have a couple of really essential relevant pieces um, that help you motivate that question um, and identify how you're gonna make a, a novel and useful contribution to the field. If it's very easy to go into Google and, you know, ask the put those keywords in or ask the same kind of question and we get an answer and that question's already been answered in the literature, then we have to kind of take the next step. Okay, well, if that has already been done, what's the next step? What do we still not know? Um, so that you can continue to ask that question about, well, how does my research question build on but differ from the existing literature? And that's something I say over and over again, because some people will tend to focus on novelty. And while novelty is important, um, the, the connection between the research question and the existing literature, what came before it? What do we know already? What do we not know? Where is that gap? or limitation in the existing literature that kind of motivates you to ask the next research question that your project will then respond to. So that's one of the things that I'm looking for in the pre-work. The second thing I'm looking for has to do with feasibility. 
And feasibility can, can be because of a number of different things. The first thing is that there are program constraints on the kinds of projects that you can do, right? You have about nine to 12 months. 12 months is the maximum, but you have about, you know, on average nine months to conduct your research. And so, you know, for example, you know, I'm a, I'm a developmental psychologist. You can't really do a developmental study in that short time period because you might not be able to do a longitudinal study. Um, and so we would need to make sure that whatever you're proposing can fit within the timeline that is afforded to you because those time frames are imposed by the, the degree program. So we look at things like feasibility in terms of timeline. We look about at feasibility in terms of, okay, well, if you've asked a question about, I don't know, um, patients with um, Alzheimer's, I'll use that example because one of our panelists um, uh, did her project on that. My next question is, well, do you have access to those participants? Um, and if the answer is yes, great, our con conversation continues. If the answer is no, then you might have to rethink, well, is there another way you could address this issue without having access to that particular population? Is it that you need to back up even more and choose a completely different project? So access to participants matters a lot because you have to be able to collect the data um, that you need to answer your research question. The other kinds of things about feasibility are more on kind of an individual basis because they partly depend on what your background is in terms of the, the training that you've had. Do you have courses that are relevant to the area that give you kind of a, a, a jump start on, on the material that you're working on? Um, are there any questions about the IRB that are gonna come up? One of the biggest challenges about the thesis track is making sure that you get IRB approval um, by the Committee on the Use of Human Subjects um, and we have kind of, we've, we've done this so much, we kind of know which ones set off some red flags. Um, the IRB is, is becoming, I think, a little bit more challenging over time. And so we're trying to make sure that we identify issues early on so that whatever project you choose, you are set up for success. Because the last thing I would want is that you, you know, you go through this wonderful process of pre-work and then you write your proposal and you're ready to go. And then you get feedback from the IRB that they won't allow you to do the project that you had proposed. Um, so we try and identify those things really early on um, so that we can have a plan in advance. Whether that is you go and talk to the, the um, liaison for the IRB early on, um, that we start to think about some you know, uh, fallbacks um, anything to really make sure that, that you are set up for success once you actually start the project. So that's the pre-work phase. Once your pre-work is approved, you've passed the kind of, you know, um, feasibility check marks, the, the kind of scholarly motivation of the question check, check marks, then you get to enroll in the crafting the thesis proposal and we have a semester where you write the proposal. Um, that's where you dive into the literature in a lot more depth than, than you would have had a chance to just on your own. You're really given the time um, to writing the, the, the literature review, the proposed methodology um, of the project. We, we break it down into chunks. We work together in groups. Um, it's a little bit of a combination between an, a tutorial an individual tutorial and a, and a course. Uh, we don't meet every week, but we meet regularly to provide you with a little bit of structure, but you're doing a lot of that work on your own. Um, and so that's where the thesis process really becomes very self-directed. Um, the things have been shifting a little bit over time such that the expectation by the program is that the proposal needs to be close to approval by the end of the semester. Um, it doesn't need to be approved exactly within the semester, but within a couple of weeks, the ex expectation is that will be um, approved. Um, and there's lots of information about the CTP that I can provide for you um, uh, later on. Um, and there's a lot of information on the thesis process website if you, you'd like to have a little bit more um, information about it. But generally speaking, the, the crafting the thesis proposal is, is in many ways um, analogous to the, the pre-capstone that Dr. Krasno was talking about before, where you're writing, you know, that, that motivating document that says, here's what I'm doing, here's why I'm doing it, and here's how I'm going to go about it. So that the reader of that proposal, who is actually a faculty member, who is, you know, a prospective um, thesis director, can read that and be really excited and engaged and want to sign on to your project um, as your thesis director. So that all happens within the crafting the thesis proposal. So that would happen, you know, at the end of 
the fall semester, end of the spring semester. The next step is probably the most variable in terms of timing, and that's where I match you with a thesis director. You and I will have a conversation early in the process about who are the people at Harvard that may have the relevant expertise to direct your thesis. We'll kind of make a little list and then we'll come back to it at the end of the crafting the thesis proposal. Um, and finding you a, a thesis director is my responsibility. Um, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to, you actually cannot reach out to people on your own about it, um, um, but it's something that, that I take responsibility for. I talk with you about what makes most sense. Are we looking at expertise and methodology? Or are we looking at content expertise? Maybe it's a combination of both. Um, so that's the, the next part. Once you have a thesis director who is signed on to be to be part of your project, then it goes through an administrative process where you, um, you enroll in the thesis course. Um, that is a very um, individualized process. It doesn't follow the academic calendar in the way that um, registering for a course um, does, but the, the ALM advising office gets in touch with you about that. Um, and then once you've enrolled in the thesis course, you are ready to hit the ground running with your thesis. Um, and launching that project is, you know, as I mentioned before, that's a, about a nine month process, which may seem like a lot of time and it goes like that. Because the first step is you need to finalize your research design with your thesis director. Maybe they have some recommendations, suggestions. Um, you know, they might want to talk with you about the um, some ideas that they have. You may want to ask them questions about how to modify it to make it better. Then once you've got that finalized, you start the IRB process, and the IRB process can be very variable in terms of um, how long that takes, um, depending on how prepared you are to, to get that going and how complicated your study is, um, but you often have a lot of support for that. Then once you get your approval from the IRB, then you start your data collection. Data collection, um, I recommend for my advisees to be no longer than two weeks. The maximum I would recommend is a month. Um, and so your, your project needs to be very focused. It needs to be um, you know, happening within a very particular window in case things go wrong. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things where you, you know, plan, for the, plan for the best, but you know, expect the best, but plan for the worst sort of thing. That's, I think that's the expression. Um, so then you have your data collection, then you do your data analysis and the writing. And now some of those things can be done alongside one another, you know, while you're waiting for your data collection to happen, you could be uh, writing the first two chapters of your thesis. Um, but you talk with your thesis director about what kind of agreement you have about the, the timeline of, of when they want to see drafts, so on and so forth. Then, of course, they, they read your draft. I do the format review and, and um, the, the thesis gets graded. So all of that from I would say the beginning of the crafting the thesis proposal to about graduation, that's about 18 months. So one of the things about the, um, the thesis is that it's, it's, a, it's an investment of time and energy um, and research, good research takes time and it's really a very valuable process. Um, but because it's a complicated process, it does take more time than the capstone. Um, and so, you know, I'm happy to talk with you about timelines um, related to that, um, but do know that it is uh, an investment of time, um, but a really, I think, delightful one and one that if you're interested in, in research, if you want to have research experience, if you plan to do a, a research-based doctoral degree later on, or just that you like research and you want to know what is the process of, of discovering knowledge, of, of kind of creating something new in terms of how we understand something about the mind or behavior. Um, I think it's a really wonderful experience um, that the ALM pro, um, program offers. So I'm gonna stop there because that's kind of a whirlwind tour of, of how that, that schedule operates. There's a lot more in terms of the content of the, the thesis and what, what are the possibilities, um, but those are the kinds of things that I think are often very helpful to have in one-on-one -on -one conversations because they often are a conversation. It's very hard for me to say what is or isn't possible without hearing from you as well. Um, so let me just make sure that I've covered all of my points. Um, and then just, I wanna refer you to the thesis process website if you have additional administrative um, questions about how that works. So I will turn it back over to um, our host and we'll go from there. Thank you, Dr. Tierney, that was excellent. Um, and yeah, we will be throwing all of those um, 
links into the chat and we'll be posting it to the website as well so that the students have um, ready and easy access. Um, I realize that I don't think I introduced you <laughs> and I apologize for that. Um, so uh, no as uh, Dr. Tierney is joining um, our panel, let me just uh, start off the introductions with her. So Dr. Tierney has a master's and doctorate in education from the uh, from Hugsey, the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and, and, you know, another master's of science in neuroscience as well. She's one of the research advisors in the ALM psychology program, meaning she leads those thesis students through that process. And she's an instructor for other courses in the extension school as well. Um, in addition to Dr. Tierney, we're happy to be joined by five additional guests for our panel discussion. Uh, Chuck Houston graduated from the ALM program here at HES in 2010, um, completing the program on the thesis track. Chuck is an academic advisor within uh, the ALM program and serves as the primary advisor for the field of psychology. Welcome, Chuck. Thank you, Max. Uh, Great to see you. <laughs> Allison Warren has a doctorate in acupuncture and oriental medicine and is currently an adjunct professor at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She joins us on the panel today as she's working on what I believe is her third master's degree, <laughs> uh, this time here at HES, and is in the final stages of her thesis track. Welcome, Allison. Thank you. Cole Fisher earned his ALM in psychology last year and works as a marketing technology consultant. Cole finished his degree on the capstone track, taking my capstone in psychometrics. Good to see you again, Cole. Likewise, thanks, Max. Emma Corbett is a pre-degree and admissions advisor here at HES and also earned her ALM in psychology here last year as well. She finished her degree with the capstone track in human development. Welcome, Emma. And Timothy Richardson is a current ALM degree candidate in psychology on the thesis track and plans to continue his academic journey into a doctoral program. Tim has been working with me this term as my teaching assistant in my evolutionary psychology course. Um, he's been doing a fantastic job. Uh, welcome, Tim. Between the seven of us, I think we can answer most of your questions. And if you want to start throwing them into the q and I'll be happy to direct them to uh, the most appropriate uh, respondent. Um, but maybe just to get us kicked off, here's a question that I'll direct um, first to uh, Emma. Was it difficult to choose between the thesis track and the capstone track? And ultimately, what kind of tipped your decision? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And for me, it was. I was going back and forth and I think it was at the last opportunity to switch that I was meeting with Chuck and discussing options. Um, essentially, I entered the degree program utilizing this experience to figure out if I wanted to continue on to a research-based doctoral program within the field of psychology um, and become a practicing therapist, or if I wanted to stay within the field of higher education um, and utilize this degree to grow in the field that I'm currently in. Um, and by the time that I got to the point of making this choice, I still wasn't 100% sure. Um, but I knew based on all the helpful information that I got from other classmates, um, from Chuck himself and instructors, that I was the learning style type person that knew I would benefit most from completing the capstone project. Um, I already had an idea for a deliverable um, and a population that I wanted to think through and help provide a solution for. Um, and so that's what I ended up going forward with, with the capstone. Thank you. And uh, for someone who made the other choice, Allison, uh, what went into your thinking? I had a very specific research question in mind um, pretty early on. And I did discuss this with Dr. Tierney um, at, at length at first of what would be the best option. But because my research question did not have an answer, um, it was pretty clear that the most appropriate track was the thesis track and to collect data and be able to analyze that. Um, and I think that for me, 
being able to uncover this process, have even more clinical practice in this regard was also very important for me because I've done a lot, I've done some research in the past, but it's it's been mostly literary, mostly not in the clinic. And this was a really unique opportunity for me to have um, you know, resources with Harvard as well as um, advice doing a, a research design in the, in the field. And so that was extraordinarily helpful for me. Thank you. Cole, here's a question for you. Um, what, what framed your thinking on your deliverable? And um, what was that process like of deciding on that final form and, and kind of shooting for and getting there? Yeah, I, I think for me, I mean, I had, I had kind of, you know, gone through all the classes, or the, you know, the courses up to the capstone point, assuming I was going thesis track. And then when, when I realized capstone was not, and I, I started digging into both, um, I realized I could really tailor this towards my current industry and passion that I've, you know, I've been in for 15 years and I know so well, but I also know the pain points and what needs to be solved. And I was really um, excited about the practicality of something that could be applied that um, people in my industry um, in, in marketing and technology could quickly wrap their minds around, identify the solution and, and uh, you know, really kind of identify with the pain points of it um, and you know, have some sort of you know, practicum to fall back to, to actually begin to solve this problem. Um, so I, I also think it was, it was uh, you know, partly, I, I don't know if it's just like the, the total extrovert in me, but I love collaborating and working with people and so, you know, having, you know, one-on-ones and, you know, Max, you were, you were as, as, you know, my professor for the pre-capstone and the capstone, you were remarkably accessible. I also liked bouncing ideas and being a, feeling like I was a part of my peers' projects. Um, and so I, I felt like that helped kind of mold things along the way. Um, and, and at no point I felt like I didn't understand where I was headed or um, where I, you know, what, what my status was, or if, if something was going to get approved or not, I always felt like I knew where my standing was uh, because of that. So um, yeah, I, I think that just kind of the, the big sort of pivotal moment for me was figuring out, you know, identifying the, my passion and the problem therein and kind of running from there. Great. Thanks. Uh... Definitely want to encourage uh, our uh, attendees in the audience to submit any questions that we haven't covered yet. Um, but I have one that I will throw to Chuck. In your experience, kind of shepherding students through this degree, um, what would you say are some of the biggest pitfalls that if you could kind of reach out and touch people's minds right now, you would encourage them to avoid? Well, that's a great question, uh, Max. And uh, I just, before I comment on that, I wanted to say how much I enjoyed listening to you and Adrian uh, describe the two options that our psychology degree candidates have. And it's been, it was really helpful to, to listen to that from your perspective. But I mean, there's, there's, there's pitfalls along the way. Uh, one of them is not reaching out for help. Uh, we wrap an inordinate amount of advising. Emma does advising. I do advising. Adrian does advising. Dante with this. We have a whole staff that's devoted to helping you make this decision and then make, you know, understanding the curricular aspects of it, the timing of it. And we do this all day, every day. So don't be shy. Reach out to your advisor, contact your advisor early. Uh, the comment was made earlier, I don't know if it was Max, uh, that, you know, getting a good feel for what direction you're going to go in at the end you know, falls under the adage of, you know, start with the end in mind. And that might affect your course choice along the way. You might select courses that will inform your ultimate project. And the uh, so the earlier you can uh, think about this, I mean, we, we kind of force you to think about it at the very beginning, at the time of admission, because Emma, correct me if I'm wrong on the, uh, during the admission process, uh, part of the application is the question, which track do you want to do? And so you will be asked to choose a track at the beginning, but um, you're not tied to that. You can switch all the way up really to about your eighth course 
even into your ninth course, really. But I mean, um, there's no hard and fast rule. If you feel you should be in a different track, you should get in touch with me right away. And we can help you determine whether you are in the correct track or whether you should switch and if so, why and so forth. So I, I think I think reaching out, um, there's a lot of help available, uh, but you have to reach out to us. And uh, so I think that's the biggest thing, Max, is to take advantage of the resources that 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 including myself, but that the school in general has. Yeah, that's great. Chuck, thank you. Um, I think, um, you know, that makes, it reminds me of, you know, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, um, but it also makes me think of a topic that has been being discussed in the university for the last couple of years, and that is kind of realizing what that hidden curriculum is, like, what are those things that is kind of part of the cultural knowledge of how you do school, and I think there's a lot of students who don't feel empowered to reach out for advising, um, and I think the message that I hope everyone is getting from this is that everyone should feel empowered to reach out for advising because we're here for you. And do reach out to us. Peer advising is very helpful. And I know it's a great source of support to so many of you to have membership in various groups, uh, WhatsApp groups and so forth to, to get uh, share ideas and share stuff. But when it comes right down to making the decision for you, make sure you reach out to our office because we can tell you for you uh, what the implications would be of switching tracks, for example. Do you have enough courses? Do you, Have you fulfilled your Harvard instructor requirement? Have you fulfilled your on-campus requirement? Um, what courses would be suitable to take next? Can you take this course at the same time as the pre-capstone course? And, you know, all these types. We can help you, in other words, with a plan of study. And um, so, yeah, so, so, so definitely, definitely find us. We're, we're findable. <laughs> Adrian, here's a question for you. I've um, heard from a lot of students that they're unsure of the relation between the thesis track and the capstone track. Um, maybe it has something to do with a thesis being the kind of traditional way that a master's goes. And this capstone thing is newer, or that the thesis takes longer, and the capstone has more of a course structure. But I, I get the impression from students that there's kind of a, a, a potential appearance that like the thesis has a little bit of a shinier gold star than the capstone does. And uh, I just, since you've um, been so involved in both, I want to hear the way that you would say no. <laughs> yeah, absolutely no. Um, there, they, I, I think there's probably like, yeah, like you say, since the thesis was, you know, we've had it for so long that, and then the, the capstone came along, people might get a sense that, you know, one is a, a better choice than, than another academically. And I don't think that's the case at all. Um, I think they're different. Their purposes are different. Um, but, and, and that's actually one of the reasons why we started the capstone in psychology is because there's so much power in psychology ideas that was, that needs to be used, right? Bridging in, in education is bridging research and practice. Um, and that's kind of the idea that we started with, um, and that we need good thinkers to do work in that space. And so it felt like there was a real gap in, in the kinds of work that, that scholarly individuals should be doing. And so for me, I think they're absolutely essential to have both of them, right? It's really important to have research. Um, it takes longer, there's more of an investment, there's kind of a, you know, a potential cachet around it, but like the, the work of, um, but, but I don't think that's true the work in any kind of applied circumstance, which I feel like the, the capstone is a, a little bit more applied in the way that you had used that analogy of, of uh, theoretical physics versus um, engineering is so important because it ha can have so much influence on so many people's lives, right? Like that's what I love about the capstone is that in, in psychology, because you're, you, the, your questions are about people. Um, and so I, you know, the work that can be done in a, in a capstone can be, you know, amazing. Um, it's different, right? And, and I think the most important thing is what is the right match 
for you. And so Cole, when you were saying that, you know, you, you felt like that was a really good match about, you know, being in the industry and kind of like you had a, a, an idea already. It depends on what your professional goals are. It depends on kind of what you want to get out of this experience. It depends on also what kind of student you are, right? Do you prefer a little bit more structure? Um, do you prefer actually to have like a little bit more, you know, room to, to try things out? Um, there are lots of considerations that go in on that, but I think that both of the, the programs um, are absolutely um, important and, and in, in some ways, like the way that education is like really important and, and we sometimes don't credit the people who do a lot of education and yet we all believe in its, in its purposes. Um, I think the same kind of thing happens with both of those, but they're excellent programs. Well said. Cool. Yeah, I, I think just to kind of add on to that, um, I, I, I know Chuck will recognize my name because, you know, talking about like researching which path you wanted to go down or asking lots of questions. Um, I, I asked a ton of questions about both tracks and really kind of dug in. And, and for me, it kind of came down to, you know, what, what, was, what was the purpose I was taking these courses to begin with? And for me, I knew um, that I wasn't necessarily uh, aiming to go into a doctorate level or, or you know, going to, into research necessarily. But I've, I've always kind of viewed my, you know, excitement for psychology classes and, and understanding human behavior in general, as this is the most applicable field to any uh, field out there, whether you're in education or in sales or technology or whatever it might be. And so for me, I, I kind of really geeked out on the possibilities of like what all this could be applied to and how a capstone can do that for me um, and, and, you know, kind of take that the practicality of what does this look like in the real world? Um, and so, you know, for me, that just kind of fit what I had been looking for and what I had been kind of taking the courses to begin with and why I was passionate about psych psychology to start with. Uh, but I also, at that same rate, to kind of back up what Chuck had mentioned earlier, I felt very informed about both paths before making a decision. So I never felt like one was a gold star or, or any different necessarily in that regard. I felt like, you know, and honestly, in the capstone, I didn't feel like it was less autonomous. I felt like there was a ton of a wide range of just the entire ocean of possibilities, just what am I going to be most excited about? Um, and like I said, I don't know if it's just the extroversion in me or what, but I, I enjoyed, you know, being in more of a, a community setting and peer feedback and things like that, that I knew was probably going to fit my learning style and, and my, you know, developing this, this, you know, project and this capstone. So. Thanks, Cole. Can um, I also and... jump in and say one more difference? Um, when you're doing a thesis, right, I mentioned having a specific research question, and it has to be super specific and super specific. And I ask you to give me more detail and refine it and refine it and you go in deeper and you go in deeper and you're like, all of a sudden you kind of some, you know, it's so narrow, because it has to be you have to have a very clear question, right? What is your statistical test going to test? right? What is the relationship that you are testing, right? Your outcome, your predictor, and it's so specific, but there's a ton of material that motivates it. It goes into it versus the capstone, which I feel like looks a little bit more broadly and does more synthesis. It's still specific. There's a specific problem that you're addressing, but you tend to be synthesizing across multiple, you know, areas. And, and that's a different intellectual experience. Both of them are intellectual. Both of them are creative. Both of them are scholarly, but they're asking you to do different intellectual moves. Um, and I think some people are, enjoy one more than the other. So that might be a useful way of thinking about it too. Agreed. Allison? Uh, just to quickly dovetail on what uh, Cole and Dr. Tierney said, I think that um, a great deal of it, at least personally, came down to number one, motivation, uh, and number two, applicability, so and practicality. So for me, you know, I think everybody, despite which path you choose, you want to make a contribution to the field, and you have this passion, and you want to give back. For the thesis part though, for me, there was such a specific research question that I wanted to answer. And there was, the evidence base was paltry. The, the literature out there did not, could not answer this question. So for me, contributing to the field is answering this question, at least in part, or getting the ball rolling. And then later, hopefully, standing on the shoulders of giants, more people will come up with this and actually use it in the field, right, for patients. Versus the, the capstone, I, the way I thought of it anyway, is such that 
there's there's evidence based out here and there's evidence based out here, but maybe we're not translating it to real world as much as it could be. And now here's this idea where we can take what has already been established and use that translational um, motivation and paradigm to contribute in the field that way. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think that helps actually uh, lead me to what I think might be our last question, because I think we're actually maybe even a little bit over time. And I uh, appreciate all of the panel's willingness to stick with us um, for a few extra minutes. Um, but I think that um, one thing we haven't touched on yet is the potentially unique role that the thesis has in setting up that future educational trajectory to a, a different degree, a um, uh, different uh, master's program or a doctoral program. Um, and so my last question is for you, Tim. So um, what was exactly uh, the kind of thinking that led you into the thesis track and is informing the research that you're choosing and how you're seeing it contributing to your future education? Yeah, so I came into school after a long period of time of just like ideas turning in my head uh, and, you know, went off to a social work program and realized that it wasn't there. Well, it was too applied. Uh, and I liked the ideas. I liked the nitty gritty stuff underneath and trying to contribute to the knowledge. And I, you know, and I see the research all the, that some of the stuff is based on. And I'm like, I, don't, I, th I think that we can do better. I think that the, the, the you know, I think that the, the field of psychology can like have a little bit more of a theoretical background to it, at least from my myopic perspective, uh, and realizing that I, well, as Dr. Tudor could probably attest, like my, I need to learn how to focus and narrow my scope and actually learn how to ask proper research questions. Um, and that like knowing how, how knowledge is actually built. And as I'm getting into this, I'm like, this is really cool. Uh, and like, all that I want to do now is like build this knowledge and then be like, all right, well, now I can like build it over here and then I can go over here. And, uh, and so, yeah, my intent is to hopefully, you know, launch this into a higher degree doing kind of, again, this knowledge building, uh, tagging on a little bit of what Allison said of like, hopefully someone else can like take this knowledge maybe that I hopefully can generate and do something useful with it. But I don't know. I, I I like the ideas. I like the the machinery under the hood. And I like you know. Don't get me wrong. Driving the car is really cool, but the the stuff that's the you know the the, the principles of physics that are happening in the engine is more important than maybe the engine itself. Um, let's see. I mean that's oh, and then I guess the other thing that you know, Dr. Krasno and I have been working on uh, working together teaching, which has been you know the other part of the. Potentially another part of going on to a higher degree would be having this be a thing that I do. Uh, that's been, this has been a great opportunity. That's kind of a different answering a different question, but um, I don't know. Just synthesizing all of the things that are available, you know, in front of me in this program has been great, and that I'm looking forward to being able to apply a lot of the stuff that I've learned in, you know, the the. The research, uh, yeah, the research path. I guess that kind of answers the question. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and then I guess the last thing that I would just add is speaking as someone who's, um, you know, been on that other side of the table, reading grad school applications and thinking about um, who makes a good candidate. Um, I, I definitely want to uh, kind of give that note to um, if going on to say a PhD in psychology or something similar is in um, the future that you see for yourself, faculty are in a fairly risk-averse position. They're evaluating someone on relatively scant information that they might have, you know, a four, five, six-year research relationship with. If it's a student that they're going to be collaborating with longer than that, even longer, right? Um, I think the average duration of a marriage in the United States when I first looked at the statistics some years ago, it was like 10 years, <laughs> given the divorce rate, it's probably lower than that now. Um, and so, you know, it's it's an on the same order of magnitude level decision. Um, and so uh, 
that the faculty are really concerned about, you know, what are the red flags that means that a student is not going to be in this for the long haul? And proving that, you, you know, you do research, you like research, you know what you're getting yourself into, those are really good signals on a grad school application to do research in psychology. And so I think that's one of the unique things that a thesis can actually do for you. Okay, I think that does bring us to the end of time. Um, our wonderful President Kimia has a, um, a closing note for us. So let me just go ahead and get that pulled up. Thank you everyone for making our inaugural webinar so special and informative. I just wanted to give a big shout out to all of our amazing speakers and panelists for sharing their valuable knowledge and insights with us. And of course, a huge thank you to all of our attendees. We're so glad you could join us today. I hope you found the information covered in the event to be really useful. And don't worry if you missed anything because we'll be posting a recording of this event on our YouTube channel within the next few days. And hey, if you haven't already, please make sure to become a member and join on social media sites so you can stay up to date with the latest news and information from our society. You can check out our website, hesps.org, to find how to connect with us. In the next slide, I will share our upcoming events that you won't want to miss. Thanks again for being here. I have some very exciting news to share with you all. We are thrilled to announce that we will be hosting an event with none other than Dr. Michael Levin. Dr. Levin is a well-known and distinguished scientist and researcher and has received numerous awards for his outstanding work in his field. His innovative research has pushed the limits of biology and opened new doors for developing effective therapies. Plus, you might be surprised to learn that his work also connects to psychology and neuroscience. We feel so honored to have him speak at our event and share his knowledge with us. Stay tuned for more details, but you can already sign up using the link provided in the chat or on the screen. Another exciting news for our society is that we are going to soon release our podcast. We are going to have multiple series. One of them is going to be about proper research methods in psychology. And Dr. Ganet Choval is going to be our first speaker that will be joining us soon. Stay tuned. It will be posted on all of our social media sites and our website. And that brings us to the end. Uh, I want to, again, thank uh, everyone who came out for our panel. That was excellent. Um, I really appreciated hearing everything that you had to share. Um, and on behalf of the society, thank you all for your participation. Thanks, everyone. And thank you so much, Dr. Krasnow. The links for our social media, I believe, are in the chat. And also the link to register for our upcoming event is also in the chat. Thanks again for being here.